another computer just in case they start drilling. That's why you see me on there twice. Oh, I was wondering. Just in case. Okay, is everybody ready? Letting everybody in. As president would like to invite you to introduce key members of his health team, he laid out a three-step plan. Uh, for getting Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, I think we are um, at four minutes past and I'm sure we'll have people continuing to enter, but I think we can get started. Um, if you haven't already, I'll ask you to read some of the, the notes on the side and remember to update your name and your pronouns as you join our meeting. And please remember to mute yourself um, as we, uh, our presenters won't uh, have so much background noise going on. My name is Karen Goodfellow. I am the Director of Public Art in the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. And in that capacity, I am the Director of the Boston Art Commission. I'd like to welcome everyone to the December 8th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. And just as a background, the Art Commission is staffed by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and is an independent board composed of two ex officio and seven appointed volunteers um, who are art and design professionals and they hold uh, these public meetings to review and vote on matters concerning the city's art collection. Meetings are generally held the second Tuesday of each month to review current public art projects cited on or proposed for City of Boston property. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually to ensure public access to the deliberations of the Boston Art Commission. The public may access this meeting through telephone and video conferencing. I'm joined by the Boston Art Commission staff working within the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, Sarah Rodrigo, Public Art Project Manager, and Trisha Gorain, Collections Manager, who will be helping to facilitate the meeting. I will now hand it over to Chair Mark Pasnick and Vice Chair Iqua Holmes, who will be calling the meeting to order and to go over some further instruction. Thank you, Karen. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm calling this public hearing to order at 4.06 p.m. Today, the Boston Art Commission will be holding its monthly public meeting. Uh, I will now take a roll call of the commissioners to confirm a quorum. After I state your name, commissioners, please say here. Iqua Holmes. Here. Camilo Alvarez. Here. Uh, Cara Elliott Ortega, I believe she's going to be late, correct? Um, Brian Hone. Here. Michael Canizzo. Here. Lisa Tung. Here. Robert Freeman. Here. John Andres. Here. Okay, thank you. So we appear to have a quorum. Um, Next slide. The commission and staff wish to provide some instruction on using the platform effectively to offer questions and comments. Uh, as you'll see on this slide, um, uh, and will be explained in a little bit more detail uh, when we get to the portions of the um, meeting where public can make comments. Um, uh, as with regular BAC meetings, project partners, members of the public may have an opportunity to provide public testimony on items the commission will vote on. After presentations and commissioners clarifying questions, the vice chair uh, and chair may invite public testimony. Please remember to keep your comments on topic and brief. More detailed instruction will be provided later in the meeting. We'll be following the publicly posted agenda, which you'll see on the next slide. Uh, this agenda has been posted publicly. 
Uh, it will begin with the director's report covering a number of topics outlined here. And as you'll see in section three is where we'll have votes and opportunities for public uh, input. Uh, we will now review the meeting minutes from the previous uh, November 10th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. Are there any comments or modifications any commissioner would like to make? Hearing no comments, I uh, will do, uh, uh, oh, actually, do we have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion that we accept the minutes as they are. Thank you. I'll second. Uh, was that Robert who second? Yes. Okay, thank you for the second. Uh, so I'll uh, do a roll call to uh, get a vote of uh, affirmative on the motion. Um, Aqua Holmes? Yes. Camilo Alvarez? Yes. Uh, Michael Canizzo? Yes. Cara Elliott, oh, Cara's not here uh, yet. Uh, John Andres? Yes. Brian Holm? Yes. Lisa Tung? Yes. Robert Freeman? Yes. Okay, so the motion passes. Uh, we will now have Karen Goodfellow give her director's report. Thanks, Mark. Um, first, we're going to start with uh, administrative items. Uh, and as you might remember, we spent a good deal of time at a previous meeting, uh, I think it was in May, uh, reviewing specific language around a maintenance fund for the Embrace that required BAC approval. The Boston Foundation wanted again to revisit the MOU and after reviewing the most recent draft, um, which was sent July 14th, 2020, we realized that the MOU no longer reflected the current situation and we are working to modify it and address maintenance and other concerns by final design. As in an MOU sh should be addressing maintenance and commercial rights um, and be executed before the date of final design approval. Um, and we are hoping to do that later this winter. We know that King Boston um, is here today for an advisory review with um, the artist team. And um, we hope before they come back for final design to have this executed and we will continue to update you on progress there. Um, and uh we're going to go over um, some in-process public art, um, starting with long-term projects. And again, just a reminder, when we talk about long-term projects, we are talking about projects commissioned to be um, installed for five years or more. Um, we are moving away from using words like permanent uh, when we're talking about the collection and are slowly transitioning into using this, this language. So on the, on the next page, um, you'll see a, a list um, the first list of projects that are ongoing. Um, these are city-driven long-term public art commissions. We've organized this list by the project phases we use for BAC reviews, which also aligns with the commission contracts payments. As I mentioned last month, Within Web by Matthew Hinsman at the Jamaica Plain BPL Curtis Hall campus is being installed. Uh, due to adver adverse weathers and delays in the supply chain, completion is expected by the spring 2021. Um, and you can see, uh, in recent photos of the installation, the, the, the formwork for the walls is in place, there is work with bricks going on. Um, and if you are in the area, you can stop by and see where that is uh, in process. Additionally, two projects are in final design phase, one of which is here tonight, jo Joe Wardwell in collaboration with Nakia Hill, will be presenting the design for uh, the Roxbury Branch uh, Clear Story project for your review and vote. Six projects are in, uh, preliminary design now. Um, both the Boston Arts Academy projects, you can see a rendering of the interior site, which Masari is designing for on the bottom right of this slide. Monica Bravo is working on her design for the East Boston Police Station. Both Vine Street projects are in process. And uh, for the DeWitt Playground, the play team, Marlon Forrester and Studio Luz will be starting their design work in the next few weeks. And we look forward to a, a busy spring of design reviews. We have two projects in the contracting phase. We are in negotiations with Sobek, um, legal name uh, Jeremy Harrison, the artist for the entryway artwork commissioned for the Roxbury branch, which was voted on last month. We'll also be presenting the artist for the Roxbury branch exterior site later in this meeting for which we'll be asking approval to enter the contracting phase. We're looking forward to bringing you the artist review committee's recommendations for the Ruggles Corridor integrated art project and the Adams Street branch of the Boston Public Library at the January meeting. 
And finally, we anticipate releasing several calls in December and January, City Hall Plaza, uh, the Engagement Center and Newmarket, uh, Mural Call and others. And um, updates on existing public art, we're gonna um, touch on the Emancipation Group. Um, and as you remember on June 30th, 2020, the BAC uh, voted unanimously to remove the bronze figurative elements of the Emancipation Group pending um, certain requirements. And here, as you look at this slide, you can see with the, the bullet points, the black bullet points are the um, aspects of your motion um, and the uh, bullet points in, in set from there are updates on the work that we've done so far. So um, your vote was pending engagement of an art conservator to document, recommend how the bronze statue is removed, supervise its removal and placement into temporary storage. Uh, and we can tell you that we have finalized a contract with Daedalus, who is the conservator, who will be overseeing the documentation of the bronze figurative elements and their removal and transfer to temporary storage. We have discussed a removal date with Daedalus and the removal will occur in late December. We're looking to get this done before the new year. Obviously, this will all be pending, um, pending weather. Um, the next uh, point that you made was that you wanted to see the commissioning of detailed documentation of the artwork into BAC archives, which may include photography of the statue in situ, drawings in a 3D scan, as well as the history of the piece and the process that the BAC took in order to make this decision. Daedalus has submitted a condition assessment, which I will highlight more on the next slide, and we'll continue to work to document and photograph this sculpture after its removal from public view and share those images in a future meeting. We'll also be able to make those publicly accessible. Um, you asked for the creation of a public event that will acknowledge the statue's history and inform the public. The Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the BAC will be planning a panel series uh, in the new year and video um, to capture the removal along with uh, interviews and individuals who have been involved in the discussion regarding monuments under review. And I'd like uh, to invite Vice Chair Holmes to add anything regarding the event right. subcommittee uh, uh, right. or um, Camilo. Well, I'll just add that um, we thought it was very important to include young yeah. voices in both the celebration and the acknowledgement of this monumental event in the city of Boston. So we've reached out to the ICA teen program as well as Art Rebound at Mass Art. And we're also planning to reach out to 826 um, young people that are already involved in public art through the um, Roxbury Library and hope that they might join us for a conversation. Um, considering some of the questions that the commission has put out there for the future of monuments and projects um, on the city of Boston landscape. So we're hoping to do a three-part uh, series of events that take into consideration different aspects of this event, and they will go into 2021. Everything will be um, publicly accessible and more than likely open to the public to join us in a Zoom format. Uh, I invite Camilo, if there's anything that you want to add to that, that I might have forgotten. Oh, no, that sounds pretty complete. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Ego. Thank you, Camilo. Um, and see, um, uh, the next point was the initiation of a process to determine how to recontextualize the existing statute in a new publicly accessible setting. Um, our update there would be that the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the BAC are leading ongoing research and outreach, including a web form and um, outreach through letters to institutions we might thought might be interested or also might have ideas for us. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll invite Commissioner Freeman and Alvarez again to um, add anything regarding the recontextualization subcommittee. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, uh, just as a reminder to everyone, I just wanted to read the names of our committee members. Uh, Kira Singleton is the director of the Royal House of Slave Quarters. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Pinder is Mass Art uh, Acting President. Representative Byron Russian is the past uh, Massachusetts legislator. Uh, Barry Gaither is director of the National Center of African American Artists. Greg Geller, uh, Boston Preservation Alliance. Marita Rivero is past director of the Museum of African American History. Uh, Camilo Alvarez, who chairs the committee with me, um, is a Boston Art Commissioner. And Nikki Green is associate professor uh, at Wellesley College. At our last meeting, we, uh, discussions led to the possibility of new sites for the Emancipation Group. Um, it was recommended that the land not, that public land not be used 
uh, for the site, but it was suggested uh, that a museum or a library or an educational institution uh, should be considered. Now, from those suggestions, the Bachmain office drafted letters to the Mellon Foundation and the Monument Lab, uh, Boston Public Library, Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, National Trust and Historic Preservation, and the Smithsonian. Uh, these letters are, are, are an invitation to begin a conversation regarding the possible new sites for the Emancipation Statue. Uh, our next meeting will be held uh, towards the end of this month or the first week in uh, January. Uh, and that concludes my report. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. And certainly ask uh, Commissioner Alvarez if, uh, if he has anything to add. That was great, Robert. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again, Karen. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Camilo. Um, and the last point that you had uh, as part of your vote was the addition of temporary signage to the site to interpret the statute prior to its removal and permanent signage after the removal. So I'll say there, we did install temporary signage. Um, we had a couple different um, installations. I think we, we lost those at this point, um, but we are planning for next steps of signage. So um, trying to think about whether we should install something you know, before, before it's removed, but also thinking about a longer term installation of signage once it is removed. And we'll con we will continue our planning work uh, and the event and recontextualization subcommittees will continue to meet um, and we'll collaborate with many other partners on this process um, regarding events this month and future plans for the sculpture. And so here um, you'll see, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, Daedalus has completed a condition assessment of emancipation group. And on this slide, you'll see photographs in the report. As part of the BAC vote, the contracted conservator is documenting the condition. On the slide on the left, you'll see existing damage to the leg of one of the figures. On the middle slide is a photo capturing previous work performed. Patches were added to the existing bronze as a repair method. Delis has also made recommendations for the removal of the sculpture. On the, on the slide on the, on the right, the conservator has identified pins visible on the bronze attaching the sculpture to the granite pedestal. Um, so uh, we will continue to update you here um, and we'll make these materials public as, as we go forward. And I will um, turn to uh, you, Mark and Igwa again. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we will now move on to items of the agenda for review, public testimony, and commission vote. You will notice at the bottom of the screen there are instructions for public testimony, which Karen will briefly go over now. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll, I'll briefly re review procedure for public comment. Following each presentation, the commission will have the opportunity to ask questions first and make comment. And then following the commissioner question and answer, we'll invite the public to do the same and to um, do so. You can see some instructions here. It's possible to comment in a few different ways. Um, you can raise your hand using Zoom um, and you can also um, let us know through the chat that you'd like to speak and you can press star nine if you're on your phone. And on the next slide, um, you can see what um, some of the, the Zoom tools look like. And hopefully your uh, platform looks something like this, but you really wanna look for the raise your hand sign. And if you don't see that anywhere, you can look for the participants button, um, possibly at the bottom of your screen to help you um, locate the uh, communication to let us know that you'd like to speak. And um, Mark and Igwe, I don't know if you want to share the guidelines uh, for public yeah, so testimony. I can um, describe these. If, uh, if you do want to offer verbal testimony, please prepare ahead. We ask that you do that. Uh, here are some guidelines for you um, in the slide above. Um, plan to speak for no more than two to three minutes. The time of your testimony is at the discretion of the commission. Uh, we understand this is a short amount of time, so we welcome longer written testimony sent to BAC at boston.gov or through the online comment forms. 
if you are uh, if you are called on, please state your name, title, program, organization. We recommend that you begin with a clear statement of your position, uh, use factual arguments and data to support your position and or personal story or experience to humanize the impact the vote would have on you. Make sure the topic uh, you wish to testify about is within the purview of the BAC. We ask that you not include violent, pejorative, ableist, or otherwise abusive language. Please be aware that due to time constraints, the chair may not be able to provide time for multiple testimonies from one community member. While you may disagree with other attendees' testimony, you may not interrupt them during their allotted time or harass the commissioners or staff. Uh, this is reserved for testimony. This time is reserved for testimony. The commission may not have time to answer questions. Please send questions to BAC at boston.gov. So these are general uh, rules of uh, our uh, testimony. Thank you. Uh, our first presentation is for the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library, Project One. Sarah, uh, Sarah Rodrigo, Public Art Manager, will introduce the project and artists. Thank you, Chair Pasnick. Um, this commission is the first of three new public art projects for the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library, funded through the Percent for Art program. Um, additionally, a fourth artwork, The Word, by Vizamuzi Maduna and Obi Simonis, which was installed at the branch um, since it was commissioned in 2005, was restored and recited on the exterior last year. The site for the project we're reviewing today is for the three walls in the main room, excuse my lack of appropriate terminology, in the main room of the branch. Uh, the central wall is indicated here and the two adjacent walls here, if you can see my cursor, and here are the project site. Um, this is an early rendering of the renovation provided courtesy of UTL, the architects for the, for the project. In 2019, the BAC Commission, Joe Wardwell, for this site. Joe Wardwell is a Boston-based artist and associate professor of painting at Brandeis University. His work has been exhibited at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and the decor of a sculpture park and museum, and he was commissioned to create a large-scale wall drawing at Mass Mocha on view now through 2022. Um, Joe is joining us tonight along with his collaborator, Nakia Hill, and two of the youth poets who collaborated on this project as well. Um, Joe, welcome. If you would like to unmute now. Um, I know you're here because I saw you earlier. Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Sarah. I would just like to thank the Boston Art Commission for inviting us to present today, as well as the Boston Public Library for their support of this project. Um, I sincerely hope you and your loved ones are well uh, during these times. Um, early on in brainstorming ideas for this project, a friend suggested reaching out to the 826 Boston Writers Program located in Nagleston Square. Uh, during our first meeting in February, in-person meeting actually, and uh, between myself, Kristen Barali, the Director of Advancement, Jenna Lushek, Associate Development Director, and Writers Room Director, Nakia Hill, we almost immediately developed uh, a collaborative rapport. And through Nakia's suggestion, we felt that the Y Lab uh, Youth Literary Advisory Board of the 826 Boston would be the best cohort to collaborate with. I'll turn it over to Nakia and the Y Lab students to talk about our collaboration, 826 Boston and the Y Lab program. But first, a brief introduction to Nakia. Nakia was named Artist in Residence in 2018 by Mayor Walsh. She's a writer, journalist, and educator who focuses on empowering women to use writing as a tool for healing and resistance. And I'm very, very grateful to have her as a part of this project. Nakia. Thank you so much, Joe. Good evening, everyone. As Joe mentioned, my name is Nakia. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm excited to um, be here with you tonight. Thank you so much for your energy and attention at the, at, at the end of a work day. It's the end of my work day. Um, so I am the Writers Room Director at 826 Boston. Um, if we can go to the next slide. 826 Boston is actually um, located in the heart of Roxbury. And 826 is a nonprofit youth writing and publishing organization dedicated to empowering traditionally, I like to say under-resourced students, ages six to 18, to find their voices, tell their stories, and gain communication skills to succeed in school and in life. 
In addition to me being the writer's room director at 826 Boston and also a writer myself and a journalist and educator, um, what I would like to know is that I am a, um, a resident of Roxbury. I don't currently live in Roxbury, but I spent the most transformative years in my life in Roxbury. So Roxbury is my home, which is why this, par um, this partnership is like so near and dear to my heart because I'm from the community and I used to borrow books from the, um, the, the branch that will be working on this wonderful, um, beautiful art project. Uh, so I would like to hand it over to one of my students, um, Asia. And Asia, I have the privilege to work with her at 826 Boston. Asia is currently leading our second year cohort uh, cohort of our Youth Literary Advisory Board. Asia is 19 years old. If you Google Asia's name, you'll see that she was recently featured this summer in Vogue magazine talking about her life as a student during the pandemic, what that experience was like for her. Um, and she'll be leading the students through um, the next phases in this, pro in this project in, in regards to the youth um, in our Youth Literary Advisory Board. So Asia, I'll hand it over to you so you can talk about um, Wild Lab's work. Thank you for that intro, Nakia. Um, I'm grateful to be able to talk a little bit about the Youth Literary Advisory Board, or YLAB. YLAB is a student-driven program. Students are selected in the fall and work throughout the school year as artists, leaders, and peer editors. They meet weekly to work on a final project. This year, the final project included a podcast and book publication. As a YLAB student, we are passionate about civic engagement and taking power and credit in society for our generation and beyond. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Kaylani, a fellow YLAB member and Roxbury resident. She attends the John D. O'Brien School of Mathematics and Science, and we are honored to hear her read us a poem. Without further delay, Kaylani. Um, thank you, Asia. Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Um, so today, I'll be presenting my poem titled, Yup, it's Roxbury. Okay, so I'll just begin. Okay. R-O-X-B-U-R-Y. Whenever I hear this, I think, yep, that's me. Where do you live? Roxbury. What? You heard me. I said Roxbury. Where do you go to school? Roxbury. Gotta love it. Roxbury. Girl, I got a story to tell you. You know where this story took place? Where? In Roxbury. The adventures here are like no other. Like, really. Yo, where's that cool girl Flyboy from, you know? Yup. Roxbury, obviously. Where else? Man, I'm hungry. You're hungry? No problem. I got you. Let's go to AK's and grab a slice up in Roxbury. Ah, uh, Roxbury, man. Don't get me started. Everyone wants to be wants to come to Roxbury. But no city can be like you, Roxbury. I'm not capping. No city can be as real as you. Slap you in the face, but hug you at the same time. Roxbury, man. Roxbury, listen. No matter how much you change, no worries. There won't be any hard feelings. I'll still love you. Jeez, you're making me soft. Don't worry, I'm not gonna cry because I'm Roxbury strong. But anyways, I'll still love you, Roxbury. Thank you so much, Kehlani, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Kehlani. Uh, thank you so much, Asia, Kalani, and, uh, and Nakia. Uh, definitely a tough act to follow. Um, I, now I'll share a little bit of my, about my process and uh, through, through describing a mural that the, the mural is currently on view at Mass Mocha that I did in uh, 2017. You go to the next slide. If you can play the stop motion. Uh, this is a brief, it's only like a minute or so long, stop motion that describes the pro layering process a similar layering process that I'll be using at the, um, for the Roxbury Library piece. In all my work, I, I incorporate elements of landscape, as you can see here, um, abstraction and text. And through this animation, you can see how the layering of these various el el elements um, creates opportunities for multiple levels of content to enter into the work. For instance, in this piece, the landscape layer was based on photographs from hikes that I took in and around the Berkshires. And there's a layer of abstraction that's coming. And in this large text, uh, this was all taken from the Boston band Mission of Burma in conjunction with uh, uh, songwriter um, Roger Miller. And then there's the abstraction 
that I was trying to put, to riff off the solid wit pieces that are already on view in Mass Mocha. Uh, so you can see, and then there's the smaller text coming here. And so that you can see, what I try to do is get the each layer to correspond to the place where the piece is located. Um, if you can go to the next slide. And you can see the uh, final text being removed. If you can go to the next slide. Another view of it coming into view. In the next slide, please. And then this is the final piece, combin combining all uh, of the various layers at one time. And the next few slides are just images of the next piece, of this the completed piece. Here's another view looking down the piece, and a detail in the next slide, where you can see the interaction of text and landscape. And in this last detail, you can see here the size and scale of the second layer of text. In all my large scale pieces. It's important to me that the, the text functions both on a billboard and a human scale, offering multiple experiences for the viewer to stand back and read the larger text, but also to move along the work and read the smaller text as one would read a poster on a wall. Next slide. Now I'll talk about the final designs for the Roxbury branch. My studio is located at the edge of Roxbury in Dorchester, and as I bike back and forth from the studio and home, I pass the library in Nubian Square almost every day. It's very meaningful for me to be a part of this project and be a part of the Roxbury Library. Next slide, please. In thinking about how to approach the project, I set out with some key goals that I wanted to address in the design. I wanted to think about the neighborhood and the surrounding community of the library. If possible, I wanted to collaborate and engage with, directly with other artists and members of the community like Nakia and the YLab writers. And lastly, I really wanted to respond to the architecture and feel of the redesigned library of the space. Like in the Mass Mocha piece, for the piece in the library in each of the layers to respond to the setting of the library and the library within the larger Roxbury community. Next slide, please. On my first visit to the redesigned library, I was struck by the airiness of the central space and the dramatic opening of light along the Warren Street and courtyard areas and the panoramic view it creates. Next slide. I immediately started to make connections with the panoramic with a panorama of the space and how I could use text and landscape along the frieze or architectural alcoves to echo this panorama and create a piece that would be dynamic yet also nestle the viewer inside the space of the central stacks. Next space, next slide. Our plan is to fill the three most central alcoves with a series of pieces that move a viewer through the landscape of Roxbury as well as include the entirety of Nakia's and the Wilabs writer's poems about Roxbury. Next slide. Now briefly walk you through how these layers, these layers to illustrate how content and process will intertwine. Next slide. Each piece will start with a base layer, in this case, a vibrant blend like a sun, sunrise or sunset. Next slide. Over this, I will stencil images sourced from various viewpoints around Roxbury. Originally, I'd thought about using one continuous landscape across three pieces, but in discussion with Nia, Nia Sorry, in discussion with Nikia, we thought it would be better to use different recognizable vantage points, such as this. Next slide. Which is taken from the top of the Roxbury Heritage State Park, looking northeast past Madison Park, the, the O'Brien to downtown Boston. During the summer and fall, I would ride around my bike throughout Roxbury, taking pictures to potentially use for these pieces. Next slide. Uh, over, this, over this landscape, we will begin to incorporate, incorporate the collaborations by overlaying the contributions from the YLab writers and Nakia, which will be stenciled over the top in their entirety and in the format in which the poems were written by each writer. In addition, a number of the poems will be translated into languages of the writer's request and will repeat the translated poem in other parts of the designs. Next slide. And then we'll apply the landscape abstract layer of the piece. And I really wanted to respond to, the, in, in this layer, I really wanted to respond to the architecture of the library. As I mentioned, I was struck by both the openness of the space, but also the strong presence of geometric, almost sculptural elements, both from the original architecture and the redesign. In my design, I lock into three elements that I echo to make reference to that will be illustrated in the next slides. Next slide, please. In the color palette of this design, I wanted again to play off what was already existing in the library, essentially repeating the gradient from purple to light green as you move through the stacks to designate adult, young adult, and the children's section. Next slide. 
In addition, I wanted to have strong vertical, vertical bands to echo the concrete columns throughout the space and a diagonal pattern in the abstraction that reflects the, the wood crisscrossing diagonal baffles in the ceiling. Next slide, please. Uh, and now we'll talk about our collaboration a little bit, but the next few slides hopefully will be clear that we see this collaboration is multi-layered with several different iterations. Next slide, please. Uh, but for the pieces and for the last stage of the process, an additional layer of the smaller text will be applied in the identical positioning as the smaller text on, underneath on the landscape layer. Next slide, please. Then the large text, just as it was in the mass mocha piece, will be peeled off and, as I showed earlier, revealing the completing piece. This is the left-hand piece. Next slide. This is the central piece. Next slide please. And this is the piece on the right. As you can see from the three images, all landscapes will be low in the paintings to allow for greater legibility or of the larger and the smaller text and gives a sense, some sense of a continuous landscape. Next slide, please. This is a small detail of one of the pieces, but gives an idea how the double text is overlapped to give full legibility, but also emphasizes the large text shapes as well through the oscillating color. All of the individual poems from Nikki and the Wild uh, writers, contributors, will be two inches to three to five, three and a half inches high, depending on the fonts. This sizing is based on the existing signage size already in the library for di directions and designations. And in my view, seems, seems to be legible from, from a distance. Next slide. At this point, I would like to mention that in addition to these pieces we are planning on putting together a print portfolio uh, or artist book that will accompany the pieces and will allow the pieces uh, to exist in multiple sites, such as other branches of the Boston Public Library, City Hall, 826 Boston, and with the contributors. Next slide, please. These will be all sourced from the images gathered around Roxbury. These prints will resemble the larger piece in both in color and in format. Next slide. And then again, the poems will be, repeat, will be printed over the top as we can see here with Kehlani's poem that you just heard. Next slide. And here's another example with Asya's poem. Next slide, please. Uh, and here's Nikia's poem, which she uh, is kind enough, will be kind enough to read for you now. Thank you, Joe. Um, so this, the title of my piece is A Nubian Ocean. And uh, this is a poem that I penned specifically for this project. And it's an ode to Roxbury. And as you guys know, if you're Roxbury natives or familiar with the Roxbury community, Anubian Notion was a store that was owned by um, Black people. And it was actually a place where I would go for everything. I would get my cassette tapes, incense my mom would get. I would get paint candy and beef patties, all of the things. So um, this is a love letter to Roxbury. A Nubian Notion. Pride wrapped around us like an emerald necklace, high up on a mission hill, projecting a beam of a bright beam of light, clinging to the essence of our communities. Sweet scents of incense danced in front of storefronts, Sazon sounds of bachata and merengue blaring loud from bodega speakers in Eggleston and Nubian Square. The sight of brass Nefertiti bangles found home on melanated wrists. We bow, we pray, we cling to teachers from the Holy Quran and Bible. We cling to teachers from our ancestors, Roxbury. We dance from juve morning, dows in sweat, baby powder and paint, from Humboldt to Blue Hill Ave. Black power stained the corners of Warren Street, from marches, from parades, from blood left on sidewalks signaling the lives lost to violence. Memories of Malcolm X and Melina Cass spray painted on brick walls. African roots derived from the coast of West Africa, Kachupa. We live in a bowl filled with twisted tongues, stirring up a melange of languages. Soul food rested on the plate served at the Silver Slipper, feeding the appetite of Chuck Turner and Liz Miranda. Beauty was groomed in Drain's House of Style and Mr. G's. Body by Brandy taught us how to care for our temples. 
Subways once flew in the sky, now silver lines, transporting us back and forth to and from the shores of Fogo, Santo Domingo, and Port-au-Prince. Each street signifies a piece of culture and our history. Memories etched up and down Madison Park Court, Ruggles, and Lenox Street. Roxbury, you will never be burned down to the ground like the Ferdinand Building. You will forever be the fabric of who I am. You will forever be the fabric of who we are. Forever, Roxbury love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nakia. Yeah, very tough to follow. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, and so if it wasn't clear from uh, the reading, all of the larger text across the three panels come from the first three lines of Nakia's poem. And here's the, an image of how the three panels would read together. You could go to the next slide. These next few images are mock-ups of how the piece, pieces will look with the overall space. This is the central panel. Can you, next slide, please. This is the central and left panels. The next slide, please. And here are the central and the right panels. Next slide, please. And here are how the three panels uh, would look all included together. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a few notes on fabrication. All three of the pieces will be assembled through multiple panels that come together to create the completed image. The central clerestory piece measuring 14 by 25 will be built out of 16 panels total. The two flanking pieces measuring 14 by 18 will be assembled out of 18 panels total. Uh, next slide, please. In this slide, the thin black lines demark the divisions uh, of the panel. Next slide, please. In the central piece, each panel will be seven feet high and a little more than three feet across. Due to their size, they will be double-sided with two short and three long crossbars to prevent bowing. Next slide. They, here you can see the double-sided panels and they have, well, they have two cleats on the back as you can see here and all panels will be produced by Fig, Fig House Studios in Brooklyn. Next slide, please. The pieces on the two flanking walls will be of lighter construction due to the structural differences of the wall. The panels will be single-sided with vertical and horizontal crossbars. In addition, each of the flanking pieces will be assembled from much smaller, from more, be assembled from more panels of smaller sizes. Each panel will be four, four and a half feet by three feet. Next slide, please. And here are some examples of the single side panels and their cleat mounting. Next slide, please, please. Uh, all panels will have, um, in all three pieces, will have horizontal and vertical alignment pins to assure no movement across the pieces and no bowing over time. And next slide, please. Sorry, there aren't flashy images on these ones, but um, here's some specific details regarding the installation uh, using the cleat system and how we would mount each panel to the corresponding wall. The larger panels on the clerestory wall will have cleats that mounted through to the plywood backing, while the lighter constructed panels will have cleats mounted into the steel studs behind the drywall on the flanking walls. In each panel, um, the cleat will mount into two separate studs for security. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, for installation, uh, discussing the project with the installer I intend to deploy, Brian Zink from Brian Zink Art Services, we anticipate uh, a two to three day installation. Uh, requiring scissors, scissors lift and a panel transport. Uh, we plan to coordinate with the Boston Public Library when we're further into fabrication and can anticipate uh, an accurate installation date. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating layered work of art with several works of art integrated into it. Uh, the poems were fantastic to listen to. Thank you for sharing those with us. Uh, I just wanted to give a minute to uh, David Leonard. I believe he might be here if he wants to say anything on behalf of the Boston Public Library. Um, thank you, Mark, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, uh, staff. It's great to be with you. Um, we we uh, have seen this work evolve and uh, continue to be impressed and happy with the direction and, um, you know, just really 
are appreciative of the fact of how rooted it is in its content in Roxbury and Greater Roxbury, Nubian Square and the other squares within, within the neighborhood, and that it comes out of, um, the content comes out of the experience, lived experience of many of the participants on, um, on the project. And so um, there was a question earlier about, I believe, um, whether it was appropriate to use one panel or three panels. And our site review um, really delivered, uh, you know, the insight that um, the space can fully accommodate um, the three panel model that you're, you're reviewing today. And uh, we're, we're very comfortable that even in some of the images, um, the sheer size and vastness of the space to maybe doesn't come through in a way where um, the works, if you can visit the branch in person, as I think I'm one of the few people who've been able to do that during this time, um, it feels like it will be um, much more proportionate as, as presented than perhaps all of the slides. So we're, we're very comfortable. We are continuing to be supportive of this, of this work and this project. And um, uh, we're, we're happy to um, see this go forward and look forward to uh, engaging with the community uh, at large really to have a dialogue about all of the pieces that are coming together to really um, shape the branch for people to visit when it's safe to do so. Um, thank you for the opportunity to offer some comments. Great, thank you, David. Um, now I'll open it up to commissioners first uh, and then we'll follow with public comments. Um, so commissioners, any questions or comments you'd like to make at this time? Uh, I don't, ha I don't have any questions because uh, I just think it's such an impressive project. I'd just like to thank Joseph and the two poets, particularly the, 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 the uh, I, I think it was Kehlani, I'm not sure of the name, um, but the wonderful poem about Roxbury. Um, it was so moving. Oh, thank you. I love the way you've collaborated, um, as j not just art, but the written word also. Um, it's so powerful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like to um, just add to that, that this is the beginning of really incorporating youth voices into uh, works of public art going forward in the city of Boston. I thought, I think I read most of the poems today. They were outstanding. And as a lifelong Roxbury resident, resident I really felt them in my heart and soul. So I, I think that the uh, young folks that are part of this group, they have bright futures and this is just the beginning. Now, I did have one question. Um, you talked about the portfolios that you're gonna be making. Are those gonna be sold or will you be gifting them to other libraries in the area? Um, my, my intention would be to be gifting them to, to Boston Public Library, 826 Boston and the City Hall in awesome. accordance with the, the um, contract of the, the Boston Arts Commission. Okay, I was just thinking that it might make an excellent fundraiser for 826 and the work that they're doing if there was a um, an appropriate vehicle to do that yeah my my dream would be to to uh yeah to, to 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 somehow do something like that so that in the future and i started to talk about this with nikia and um kristen barali i would love to um figure out a way so that this project could then sort of launch an idea within the arm of 826 boston of having sort of a text and image curriculum or text and image um, format so that, that, that what they do, the fabulous work that they do already with publishing could then also extend into the world of art as well. Awesome. Um, I have one more question. You've chosen your three sites in Roxbury. Am I right or wrong about that? Uh, the sites, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, they could be changed again, but the, site, the sites that I used in the images that were represented were um, uh, one from Mission Hill, one from the top of Fort Hill, and then from the top of the, um, the one that was the most prominent was the example was from the Roxbury Heritage State Park. Okay, so just throwing this out there, you're the artist, um, but the old orange line has such resonance in our history. And when it came down, it's, it's very much a demarcation between before the orange line and after the orange line. So, I mean, I'm old school. I've been in Roxbury my whole life. It may just be something from my generation, but 
it's a suggestion I'm throwing out there um, if you're still great, great, great. Yeah, the yeah. idea. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Any other commissioners? I do. I just have a question. Um, Nikki and Joe, thank you so much for your presentations and for all the presentations and performances. Um, I think in one of the past iterations of the panel design, some of the panels had a dimensional text um, or kind of a raised from the surface text. And I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding that this Correct. Kind of design Correct. is the text is kind of flat with the surface of the panel. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There was two iterations of the in, in the um, preliminary design where I was uh, um, looking at a more dimensional um, aspects to the piece. Um, when uh, I continue after the, the preliminary design review in May, uh, I continued to work on some tests in the studio and with the um, feedback of uh, sort of greater, uh, the importance of, of including, um, you know, deci the decision to include all of the writing in its entirety made a much more complicated visual experience. Um, and for me in the pieces in the studio to then incorporate dimensionality, it became, um, in my view, it became the pieces that I have going, which I'd be happy to, to send to the um, commission if they like to, to look at it, but it became almost sort of a, what I would say is overly gymnastic um, with no real purpose to making the art better. And it seemed, and then when um, we expanded out to the three panels, um, it seemed that the, 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 the presence of the piece and the um, more complicated layers would then um, come forward. And that to then add dimensionality on top of that would add, in, again, in my view, unnecessary complication and sort of detract from the meaning. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from other commissioners? I had one question. Um, Joe and Nakia, thank you so much. It's a really amazing piece that I think combines the library what people are going to be coming to the library for along with the neighborhood. And I so appreciate such a sort of thoughtful integration of all of those things. Um, you had mentioned that the text of the smaller poems will be about two or three inches high. And there was one image um, from a bit of a distance from those where I was maybe a little bit skeptical that you could read those poems. Um, but looking at that image, it does seem like you'll be able to, but I'm wondering if you've considered ways that those writings will be available to people perhaps in the library, perhaps unencumbered from the layering so that if they're interested, they can perhaps find um, some of those materials in the library to read. Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we uh, yeah, we've been thinking about that and we might have some kind of like um, with the print portfolio, thinking of having something with that, that could be readily accessible in the library that could have the text in, in presented in a similar format. We just haven't figured out exactly how that, how we would have that form accompany the print portfolio. But that was kind of in, initially um, the, the genesis for thinking about one, you know, the two, the two sort of real, two reasons that I think that, that sort of drove our discussions about having sort of more um, in addition to the piece with the, with the print portfolio or artist book or whatever is the, is the idea of having, um, you know, something that someone can interact with in, in a way that was, was not just sort of on the wall. And then also that, that could then move the experience of creating the spe the, this piece with the poets and the collaborative aspects of it could live beyond just the site location. So then it could move around, if that makes sense. So that not only could it be available for people to read in the library, but also then it could be available in other locations as um, ways to enter into the artwork. Thank you. I also really appreciate the multiple languages that will be represented in the, in the uh, poetry. I really appreciate that. Thanks for your feedback on that. We made yeah. sure we <laughs> made that update. 
Um, I just add that I, I got to know the original architect of this building quite well over the last few years. And uh, one of the lines that I always appreciated, he talked about his architecture, wanting to see it adorned by future generations with decorations and other things. Mm. Uh, and I think, although he passed away this year, I think he would be very uh, proud and excited to see uh, Keilani's addition and all of your addition to his building as a future generation. Uh, taking over and presenting their ideas um, in the space of the building. So I'm, I'm excited about that as well. Um, I'd like to now, if there are no other commissioner comments, I'd like to uh, open it up to some public comments. Um, I see Akuna Ana has raised her, raised her hand. Yes, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, I, my name is Akuna. I am the, um, programs and community outreach librarian at the Roxbury Branch Library. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks to the artists, the poets, and um, the muralists for breaking down the layers. When I first saw the piece, I wasn't sure how to think about it. So thank you for um, going into what each layer meant. Um, I think it's very thoughtfully done. Um, I'm having trouble because um, I think that this process of getting this piece here was not as public as it could have been. Um, and uh, it makes it really difficult for me to be as happy as I'd like to be about um, all of the things that we're talking about today. Um, the, the next generation and their imprint on the, on the library, um, which we always want to see, but it's so hard to um, settle that with not knowing you know, when an art piece is coming, um, not knowing if the community has had an uh, ample opportunity to discuss. I know you said that the meetings are public, but it, I don't think that these meetings have been publicized in a way that the community knows about. I certainly didn't know. And just the final thing about that piece itself, I, I think one thing to consider for art in, in Nubian Square is that there is also an Afrocentrism um, that's very core to this square, um, at least from my, you know, from my vantage point. And when I first moved here, that's what kind of grabbed me. Um, and I think it would be good to think about that for some other, for future um, public art here at the library or just in this area, that that's something that I think pulls people back to the area again and again, is the call back to Africa. Thank you. Can I just um, respond just quickly that um, the selection committee is made up of uh, commissioners, architects, community members, and we are always looking for people who are willing to come to the meetings and look at presentations by artists. So Akuna, if you are open to that, if you could just put something in the chat with your information um, and we can reach out to you in the future or anyone else that you know um, who might be interested in sitting in four or five meetings and making some determinations about what would be best for um, the library and other public art projects. Thank you for that comment. Um, our next speaker, uh, Che Madian. If you unmute yourself. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. I just wanted to Thank Akuna for bringing that issue up. And I also wanted to point out that Akuna works for the Roxbury branch and the fact that she had not been invited or did not even know this process had already started, I think speaks to what she is trying to address. But I, the comment that I wanted to make is I wanted to also lift up something that ACOR said around Nubian Square. In fact, I'm gonna be bold enough to say, take out Mission Hill. Two reasons. One, Mission Hill has its own branch, which is the Parker branch. And number three, if you're going to include other areas that have rock, that's have Roxbury Library branches, you want to, then you mean you would have to put in Eggleton Square, which I, you know, which might be a stretch. So let's let's you know let's kind of keep it closer to the actual Roxbury branch, formerly known as Dudley, um, because partly because Dudley was like the downtown for, for Black folks, and. Um, even in the time period when it was harder for us to get to the downtown, everything we needed at one point was right there in what's now called Nubian Square. So it's, it's very important for the history. 
you know, because in fact, if you want to get technical, historically, Grove Hall has, it was Roxbury. It was because of the manipulations of city moving zip codes around that Grove Hall became Dorchester. So I just wanted to say, let's put Nubian Square in there. Let's not do Mission Hill because they have their own branch called Parker Hill. Thank you. Uh, are there other members of the public that would like to speak before we move to a vote? Okay, hearing none, thank you to those who did speak. Um, and we do take our uh, outreach effort seriously, uh, but we know that we can do better in the future. Um, and I hope that we can reach you uh, an AQUA's uh, suggestion that perhaps you join processes in the future, uh, I think is a great one. It'd be nice to have more community members uh, represented uh, more broadly in, in the work that we do. Okay, so uh, next up we have, uh, uh, I, I guess we should see if um, there is any further discussion and or a motion that would be placed on the floor related to this artwork. Yeah, I just is it too late to? Uh, no, we could go back. It's it's never too late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I really enjoyed the art, especially um, the inclusivity of the local artists um, and how you found a way to build teams and bring the two arts together. Um, and I would just, my only suggestion would be to really focus on additional artists in the area because I know Roxbury is blooming with them. Um, so to find a way to, to further include in future projects, further include those artists. Great. Thank you. Um, Karen, I believe we are going to be talking about one other artist who's local to the community, correct? Um, yes, we have two other um, commissions happening at the library. If you weren't with us last month, we announced uh, or we asked the commission to review um, another commission for um, Jeremy Sobeck Harrison on the interior of the library. We don't have that um, in today's presentation, but um, we will have a post about it soon. And if, if you're curious, we can get that to you. And we'll be going over um, next uh, another ask to the uh, commission to uh, review an artist selection to start a community process for a new project. I think Jeremy's on uh, online with us. I, oh, I would, is he? I'd invite him to just say a few things about how he feels about this commission. Jeremy, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. I'm putting you out there. Uh, <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you, by the way. <laughs> yes, good to see you too. How are you feeling right now? This is a pretty big commission for you. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely my biggest, so I'm just soaking in everything because this is my first go round. Um, it's not my first commission, but again, this is like my first city kind of funded or driven commission, if you would. So it's definitely my biggest, so I'm very excited about it. And we're all excited too, to see you as a part of the City of Boston's collection going forward. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's uh, move <laughs> now to the... Um, um, to the commissioner uh, discussion and uh, any um, uh, motion that we might put on the floor. So any additional questions based on input from the community or uh, any other thoughts that came up, commissioners, before we move to a motion? Do we have a title for this piece? Uh, Work, working titles are, are everything the tag I learned early on that they have to be titled uh, what the paintings are what they say <laughs> so uh, which which part of the poem will it be or will it be the whole thing uh, well I that I'm gonna have that discussion with Nakia but okay so yeah, we'll work on it and based on the community's feedback maybe we can get the um, I'll talk to talk to you, Joe, about that. But I, I was taking notes of the community's feedback. Maybe we can get them involved in helping and having maybe some of the um, the staff at the Roxbury branch involved in that process to help us with the title. I'd be open to that. I'll definitely reach out to you guys directly. I'll find your email. 
Thank you for that. Um, Mark, I just want to add a, a comment that um, I do agree with some of the comments from the uh, community uh, about re-looking at one of the images. And I, I do agree that this should be more um, Roxbury centric and sort of had question the image of Mission Hill. Um, so I would uh, suggest that the artists uh, reconsider the panel with the Mission Hill and see if there's a way to incorporate a Roxbury um, image. Do you guys want to comment on that? I mean, um, do you feel open to that? Um, j j just to be clear, is, the, is that uh, the text that says Mission Hill or the, the location? No, I think it's the uh, image. It's the image of showing the mission church. That, that's my sense is. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. Because I think you could find, I mean, Equa's suggestion that maybe it is the um, elevated train or something. I'm, I'm assuming you could find a nice image of uh, Roxbury to replace the one of the mission church. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have, I have a lot mm -hmm. of that. That would not be difficult. Okay, um, so I'm, I wonder if we could entertain a motion. I don't know if, Michael, you'd want to make a motion that includes that um, request, maybe, or? I will try. I make the motion is to approve the um, art piece as presented with the proviso that the image of the uh, Mission Church be rethought and replaced with an uh, appropriate image of uh, Roxbury or even um, uh, the Nubian Square. Okay. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Do I hear a second? Second. Right. Sorry, who is the second? I'll Lisa. second. Or, Lisa. or, or Rob. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Either. The group I'm, second. I'm going to call, Lisa. Gonna call it Lisa this time, Lisa. You, you don't have as many meetings left with us, so oh. uh, we'll get you in there. Okay, so I'll go through the commissioners uh, for your vote one by one. Aqua Holmes? Yes. Camilo Alvarez? Yes. Michael Canizzo? Yes. Cara Elliott Ortega? Yes. John Andres? Yes. Brian Hone? Yes. Lisa Tung? Yes. And Robert Friedman? Enthusiastic, yes. And I am equally enthusiastic in my yes. So the motion passes. Uh, thank you very much and congratulations to the artist team and I think to the community uh, for weighing in um, at this stage. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Karen, uh, I believe you're next. I'm up next, yep. Uh, so um, this is another project for the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library. This is the third one. Um, the site for this commission is the upper wall of the exterior of the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library. You can see the project site outlined in the red box of this photograph, um, courtesy of Brett Benson at uh, UTL, and looking south towards the branch from the intersection of Dudley and Warren Street. And um, I'm not sure if it still looks like this up front, but this was taken um, during a construction period. And if we go to the next slide, uh, the artist Ricardo Deem5 Gomez was born and raised in Boston. Deem5 has over 20 years of experience in commercial design and public art. His most recent public work in Boston is the public street painting installation in Roxbury titled Rules of Engagement, seen in the top right. You can see other past works by Deem5 here. With this impressive portfolio, including works like his installations at Bartlett Yard and Roxbury Love that are no longer standing and are both pictured here. We would like to ask for your approval to Commissioner Ricardo for a new work at the Roxbury Library. With your approval, we'll start the contracting process and then initiate a community process as we normally do for design development. Thank you, Karen. So I think we should see if any commissioners have questions for Karen or comments to make? I, 
I will add that I'm very excited about this. I think it was a, um, a loss for the neighborhood when Roxbury Love was taken down, a, a deep loss. And this is um, exciting to know that a new piece is going to be coming. No other comments? This is just to make sure I'm clear, this is a city driven commission, correct? Yes, so this okay. will be, um, so as we started saying, we have three new commissions at this site. Um, so we have the first with Joe and Nakia and the um, um, H26's Y Lab. The second one is with Jeremy Sobek Harrison, who we met very briefly. Jeremy, thank you for that. Um, and the third we're proposing is with Ricardo Gomez for an exterior mural, which we would start the process of with your approval. And then we would um, go into um, community conversations. Okay, so if there's no other comments from commissioners or questions, uh, we can see if there's any public comments. Uh, if any members of the community would like to, oh, I see uh, Jeremy Harrison. Yes, I don't know if I like have any like weight in this decision, but Richard Gomez was my first supervisor at Artists for Humanity. So he is the main reason why I'm this far in the art world because I try so hard to be like him. <laughs> so yeah, I, I this I'm excited that y'all even considering him. I, I didn't know this. So I'm gonna call him and be like, hey, how come you ain't tell me? But yeah, I'm I'm all for Richard Gomez, if that means anything in this meeting. Sure, and you'll be working together. That's uh, pretty fantastic. Yeah, we actually have plans to um do a wall in Austin Brighton. Hopefully next week if the weather's good. So yeah, that is big brother right there for me. I'm so excited. Great. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, other comments from the community or the public? Hearing none, uh, we will move to a uh, vote process. So do I hear a motion on the floor? I can make a motion that we um that we award this commission to, um, oh my God, I'm not gonna be able to think of his name right now, Ricardo, <laughs> uh, for the Boston Public Library, Ricardo Gomez. Um, yeah, I, I recommend that we do that. Okay. I second. Cara has seconded. Uh, I will read off the names of the commissioners uh, for your vote. Aqua Holmes. Yes. Camilo Alvarez. Yes. Michael Canizzo. Yes. Cara Elliott Ortega. Yes. John Andres. Yes. Brian Holm. Yes. Lisa Tung. Yes. Robert Freeman. Yes. And I am an enthusiastic again, yes, uh, on this one as well. So uh, the motion passes, uh, and uh, I would suggest that um, somebody share the good news. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, and we'll we'll reach out to Ricardo and. Um, Jeremy, we should, uh, we should talk about uh, artist talks for you guys. Yeah, Jeremy, you could text him now, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if y'all will allow it, I would definitely love to. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, all right, uh, so I think we... Yeah, we're moving on to um, the embrace. Um, I'm recusing myself from this and Aqua will take over as chair. So this, this portion of the meeting I will chair. Our next presentation is an advisory review for the Embrace, which is the uh, King Memorial that is going to be cited on the Boston Common. The advisory review gives project proponents an opportunity to share their proposal publicly before fabrication, installation, and maintenance plans are completely finalized so that they can hear any concerns now and have a successful review and vote later. So I'm not sure who's here from King Boston, but um, feel free to unmute yourself and begin your presentation. I think we'll be kicking off with Amari. Amari, are you out there? I'm waving my hands. I, I got the tropical background. I'm sending everyone warm <laughs> vibes. So I, I, I stood on this wall and, and, and I, you know, my name is Imari Paris Jeffries. I'm the uh, new executive director of King Boston. Uh, I've been on since May, but I'm going to say new because I actually haven't seen the inside of uh, of my office uh, 
I started um, during the pandemic. So I am going to use my new card until um, there's some new Zoom rules around when you can't say new anymore. So I, I'm excited to be here today. I, I've been to several uh, commission meetings. Um, my, my big sister and mentor, uh, Marie St. Fleur, um, was uh, presenting many, many of these uh, renditions. And, and, and I was here as uh, emotional support and clapping. So you might remember me as the obnoxious guy in the back clapping whenever Marie might have said something. So uh, now, now I'll good talking and ho hopefully somebody will clap for me uh, if, if they hear anything uh, good. I, I've been thinking about these, this presentation for a few days and I know that people have seen versions of it. Uh, the inspiration of, uh, of the embrace is uh, a photo when Dr. King won uh, the Nobel Prize uh, hugging Mrs. King. And so uh, two days from now is the anniversary of, uh, of Dr. King winning the Nobel Prize, uh, December 10th, 1964. And so I've been thinking about this presentation and thinking about Dr. King and the Nobel Prize. And when he won the prize, his quote was that every single penny uh, of the $57,000 uh, would be dedicated and given to the ongoing civil rights struggle. And so when we think about the embrace, uh, and, and we've been referring to uh, the embrace and King Boston as a holy trinity of embrace ideas, the embrace memorial, uh, and the King Center for Economic Justice, Every single ounce of our penny energy, uh, every dollar we raise will be dedicated to the ongoing struggle for anti-racism and justice for Boston. So I'm happy to be here today to present um, our progress thus far and talk a little bit about um, the plaza, the Embrace Memorial itself, the art, uh, and then some of the other King Boston um, programming. I, I know that we're here mostly to focus on the memorial itself, but I, I have a few friends with me and we'll We'll talk a little bit about the plaza as, as we go along. Awesome. Well, welcome, Amari. It's, it's finally great to meet you. I, I, I feel like uh, I know you because I've seen you, but we, we've never met face to face. So th thank you for having me here today. This is as close as we can get during the pandemic, but hopefully there'll be a real face to face down the road. Yes, I, I, I have a piece of uh, a material to, to, to share with you. And so ho hopefully maybe that'll be an occasion for us to uh, to connect in a socially distanced uh, heat lamp sort of way. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sounds good. So I think someone else is driving. So I I'll just like pause like five seconds and, and hopefully that's, that'll be like the old school beep. Or I can make a beep sound and then we could change the, the slides. Um, but we, we've been starting um, our presentations of the Embrace with Land Acknowledgements. And so when we think about uh, placing the embrace, this 22-foot memorial in Boston Common, uh, we want to remember that this was the historic land of the Massachusetts people. And in the convergence of these three pandemics, one viral, one racial, one economic, uh, we have an opportunity, and I'm referring to it as post-vaccine, uh, for Boston to emerge as a better place. 400-year anniversary of the uh, Pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock. We, we're on the hills of what it means to be visitors in uh, land that doesn't historically belong to us. And so we want to acknowledge the Massachusetts, the Nipmuc, and the Wampanoag people, uh, particularly as visitors building um, on their historic land. And so you might, might have heard the story. One little known fact about Boston, um, or maybe it's not a little known fact, we, we are the fourth largest college town in America. Um, although we are the ninth largest city. And so the other four large college towns um, follow uh, population tracks. So New York is the largest college town. LA is the second largest college town. Chicago is the third largest college town. And Boston is the fourth largest college town. And so the Kings met as college students in America's fourth largest college town. And so we imagine uh, what history might have been like if Boston was the place that we imagined post-vaccine and the Kings decided to make Boston the center of the civil rights movement and Roxbury was the heart of that movement, what would Boston look like today? And so we have this other opportunity to do that today. And so we remember the Kings meeting in the 50s and so grateful that they were here. I was earlier um, at 12th Baptist Church, which was King's uh, home church, actually both of the King's home church while they were here uh, for a ceremony. We gave out 12 
uh, gifts of, of $10,000 to 12 community activists for their work during the pandemic. And so it was an exciting day uh, to be out there at 12 Baptist Church Live and honoring the Kings uh, today uh, at 12. And so when we think about uh, the King's return back in 65, uh, and we think about the civil rights movement in Boston, we're, we're framing the movement um, as these critical years, 63 to 67. Uh, 63, because the activists who um, worked, lived, uh, and struggled in Boston uh, paved the way for Kings to return in 65, uh, and the folks who persevered after the historic march. And so thinking of this time um, as, a, as, a, a, as a larger window uh, when, when the Kings returned in 65. And so I was here today. And so when we think about this important uh, time and movement, uh, we think about the Reverend Michael Haynes. And so Michael Haynes um, was the pastor of 12th Baptist, uh, a state legislator and a good friend of Dr. King. And so when we think about this period, we think about Reverend Haynes. And when we think about this period, we think about a lioness of Roxbury in the community, Ruth Batson. Uh, Ruth Batson was many things, uh, a mentor, a friend, a mother, a grandmother, a sister. Uh, but during this time, one of the things that she was, was the chairwoman of the Public Education Committee of the NAACP Boston branch. And so when we think about this period, we remember and think about Ruth Batson. We also think about Reverend James Reed. Uh, Reverend Reed was one of the martyrs of the civil rights movement in 1965. He was killed at, while um, marching um, with activists by white supremacists. And so uh, we remember uh, Reverend Reed, a Unitarian minister from Boston, uh, when we think about this period and his contribution to civil rights in America. We remember Reverend Wood. Reverend Wood was one of the original architects of the 1965 Freedom March. Um, during his time here, he uh, uh, ran many organizations, but he became a nationally known figure uh, after his time in Boston. So when we think about Boston's contribution to civil rights, uh, we think about Reverend Wood. We, we, we honor and remember both uh, Otto and Muriel Snowden. And so Freedom House, an important institution in Roxbury, a place that many of us have uh, cut our teeth, had our first school dance, uh, went through Project Reach, uh, learned how to create a resume, um, all the things that make a community special. We remember Muriel and Otto, uh, Otto Snowden who started Freedom House in 1949, icons of our community. We remember Reverends Breeden and, and, and Carter. I was on a, 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 a forum um, a couple of weeks ago and someone wrote in the chat that uh, their parents were married by Reverend uh, Breeden and that their, um, their cousin was uh, christened by Reverend Carter. And so uh, these two men who met at Dartmouth College while they were uh, college students came back to Boston and among many things, uh, organized the 1963 Stay Out of School Freedom Campaign for Civil Rights, um, and, and thousands of Black Bostonians gathered and protested um, school inequity and school injustice uh, during their time. So we remember Breeden and Reverend Breeden and Carter when we remember Boston's civil rights history. We, we also remember and honor um, Mrs. Margaret Mosley, and Mrs. Mosley was one of the women activists uh, who, uh, with among other leaders, uh, traveled uh, to Selma, Alabama to work on voting rights. And so we remember Mrs. Mosley when we remember Boston Civil Rights Movement. We honor and remember Sarah Ann Shaw. Uh, Sarah Ann Shaw, a um, wildly popular newscaster, activist, 
uh, and, and, and leader. Uh, she is a grandmother to many of us, a mentor to many of us. And so we remember Sarah Ann Shaw when we think about Boston's civil rights movement. We also honor Reverend Davis and Reverend Davis is to Dr. King's right. He was the, uh, the pastor at Charles Street AME, one of the oldest and historic black churches in America. Um, we remember uh, Reverend Davis when we think about Boston's contribution to the civil rights movement. We also uh, remember and honor Reverend Carter, who was the pastor at All Saints Lutheran Church, uh, a leader and icon uh, and whose work uh, really focused on um, Boston School Committee uh, and the injustices of Boston's public education system. And so we honor and remember Reverend Carter. These, these two gentlemen that I'm sure no one's ever heard of, uh, Mel King and Hubie Jones, uh, we, we honor and remember um, Mel King and Hubie Jones and, and uh, Hubie is uh, a mentor of mine. And so if you've ever had an opportunity, I, I used to before we were uh, sheltered in place, meet with Hubie every six weeks for an hour lunch. Uh, and that hour lunch is usually a two hour lunch. Um, and so we honor and remember Mel King and Hubie Jones uh, contribution to Boston civil rights landscape and movement one of the first actions that they did together was the general boycott of 1963 uh, where they called for a general strike of discrimination and unemployment housing and police brutality uh, in boston so we honor and remember uh, these two icons um, when we think about boston's contribution to the civil rights movement And so, you know, th this is uh, a, a quote that, it, that inspires me because when we think about what does it mean for Boston to emerge post-vaccine, um, I, I, I hearken back uh, to uh, Dr. King's quote. Dr. King, what, he was many things, including maybe the a time traveler Wikipedia. If you ever want to um, find something uh, that, that will inspire you about almost any subject. Dr. King has probably written about it. He was one of the first public scholars, but this speech uh, when he returned in 1965 is I think in, in important uh, and relevant to, to today. It says, it would be irresponsible of me to deny the crippling poverty and injustice that exists in some sections of this community. The vision of the new Boston must extend into the heart of Roxbury. And so it's, um, it, it was great to be uh, today at the Boston Arts Commission while we were talking about our, 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 our neighborhood, our community. Boston must be a testing ground for the ideal of freedom. And so this was the speech or part of an excerpt of the speech that he gave uh, when he was here for the historic 1965 Freedom Rally. And so what does it mean? I think it's important when we think about King Boston's approach uh, that we are thinking about the two historic centers of Boston. One, the economic center um, located in one of America's oldest parks, the Boston Common, the home of the Embrace Memorial and the 1965 Freedom Plaza. The other, Nubian Square, where the King Center for Economic Justice will be located. Um, and, and I say Nubian Square, I mean Roxbury. And so this 2.7 miles, uh, the original corridor, the original route of the march, starting in Nubian, ending at the Common Department Bandstand, is important for placemaking. Uh, it's important to think about how uh, the community looked in 1965 and how it looks today. And so we think about building uh, these two uh, important uh, pieces uh, to, to understand how important they are for Boston's two hearts uh, our financial heart, our oldest uh, park, and, and our geographic center, uh, Nubian, and the heart of Boston's Black community. And so this is just an artifact. One of the uh, functions of the King Center for Economic Justice is to be a home of, uh, of artifacts. And so this is one of the important artifacts from the 65 March. And so you'll see in fine print, there were four reasons why King returned to March. 
those four reasons were uh, racial equity, housing, public education, and poverty. And so we think about Boston today, 65 years later, racial equity, housing, um, poverty, and public education are still challenges. And so the King Center for Economic Justice has an opportunity to think what it means to uh, contemporize the, the, the meaning of this march and King's work while he was here in Boston. Um, so, some other images from, from the march. I think the image, I think Jonathan, who might be here, or Justin, um, the image to the right is uh, looks like um, Huntington Avenue near the Midtown Hotel. And so it all, the Midtown Hotel almost looks exactly like it did um, in 1965. And so I talked about this holy trinity of work. Um, you know, King Boston thinks of itself as in three parts. Uh, the Embrace Memorial, um, which is the piece that we're here to talk about mostly today. Uh, embrace Ideas. And so when we think about the roles of monuments and memorials today, uh, we all know that it is more than just erecting something that is static, a piece of metal, a piece of stone. Uh, memorials are live and active. And so Embrace Ideas is the uh, activation of the Embrace Memorial, and then lastly, the King Center for Economic Justice. And so what is Embrace Ideas? Some of you, this is a, a, something new. Uh, so what we know is memorials and monuments are political. The Daughters of the American uh, Confederacy built most of their memorials in the 1920s uh, as markers of fear, and intimidation for black folks. And so memorials are not just um, static pieces of steel in the ground, uh, they are political. And so what does it mean for the embrace to be political in Boston? What does it represent? And so we understand that the embrace memorial represents uh, a new Boston. It represents King's notion of radical love. It represents joy, well-being, truth and reconciliation. Uh, we understand that the arts must be engaged for these conversations, uh, reconciliation, healing, and justice. And we understand that public places are key to vibrancy and resilience, and that well-being and joy must be prioritized in anti-racist and justice work. And so this is what Embrace Ideas is. And so if you could imagine that uh, the King Center for Economic Justice is the Aspen Institute, Embrace Ideas is our Aspen Ideas. And so it is the activation of the memorial um, through the arts. And so I, I talked about this earlier, I won't read these, but this, this is the focus of the King Center for Economic Justice's work. Economic justice will, will operate through a pathway of wealth building, um, housing and home ownership, racial equity and public education. The King Center for Economic Justice will focus on research, policy, data, and community organizing. And so I am going to, uh, I think we'll answer questions at the end, Karen, if, if that's okay. So we'll keep going. So I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, uh, Justin Brown to, to take over. Thank you so much, Amari. Um, it's an honor to be representing uh, King Boston and the Mass Design Group um, here today. Uh, we're looking forward to giving you an update on the um, landscape design and the sculpture design uh, of the memorial, uh, looking towards um, a final approval in the new year. Uh, so we, we really welcome all of your thoughts and feedback um, as we um, um, share today. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Melissa Naranjo, who is a landscape architect on the team with us. And uh, we'll begin with a quick overview of updates to the landscape design since uh, you last saw it in April, um, and then pass it off to our uh, artist collaborators, um, uh, Hank Willis Thomas's team um, will introduce themselves when, when we get to that point. Um, Next slide, please. So since we last met in April, we've been having an, uh, a number of uh, conversations with 
Boston Parks Department and the, the ongoing parks master plan effort. Uh, this drawing is actually a part of that, um, that larger design effort, um, which includes um, uh, the introduction of a, a visitor center just to the north uh, of our site. You can see it noted uh, King Boston, the circle in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, next slide. Here's a, a quick axonometric uh, from the north looking towards the south. You can see the Parkman bandstand uh, in the image uh, beyond. Um, the components of the design uh, remain intact. Uh, most significantly, uh, the Peace Walk, which um, uh, commemorates uh, the individuals that uh, Amari uh, just referenced, as well as uh, an important quote about the active nature of love uh, by Coretta Scott King, uh, as well as a circular plaza uh, that presently uh, has the capacity for um, 350 people using a sort of general calculation from a gallery, indoor gallery space, um, which is uh, the, um, uh, the home for the, uh, Hank Willis Thomas's extraordinary em, uh, embrace um, bronze uh, sculpture, which we'll be digging into in more detail. Um, next slide, please. So here's a, a plan view of that, uh, of that perspective, just orienting you. Uh, north is uh, to the right in this image. Um, uh, and um, you can, see that our previous design uh, is dashed in white. Uh, the plaza has shrunk uh, slightly in, in, uh, in its area um, by uh, just under 5,000 square feet, uh, which came at, at Park's request for more green space and we think uh, is really beautifully right-sized with the scale of the sculpture. Uh, the plaza, as I mentioned, is still significant in, in size and can accommodate standing over a thousand people. Um, and um, you can see um, the points of access uh, to the site um, are really uh, quite important to the concept uh, and the orientation to the artwork. Um, if you move to the next slide, um, these three points of access, A, B, and C, uh, which Melissa will speak to um, in more detail. Uh, a is uh, really oriented to the north towards the state house. Uh, B is oriented towards the south, towards Roxbury, towards the community, uh, and also towards Coretta's uh, quote. Uh, I know it's small on this wall, but if you remember from the previous, the quote wall is the arc uh, uh, on the uh, bottom side of the, of the circle. Uh, and uh, pathway C uh, is on direct access to the Parkman bands bandstand just off the screen to the left. Um, and I will uh, pass it over to Melissa here to uh, dive a little bit deeper into these three axes of approach and the three zones of landscape that are, are created around, uh, around the plaza. Thank you, Justin, and good evening. Um, so what we were trying to do here, and the plaza is the, the fr it's framing the embrace and the side is embracing the plaza and all of this, um, it's, it's working together. Uh, we are doing like a couple of refinements, but at this point we are very happy to see how the topography between A and C uh, speaks about more like the nestling of the, of the embrace, of the plaza. Uh, you can see the crest, the high points and the low points um, like revolving around it. Then we have between B and C, we have a zone that it's a little bit more like an extended part in terms of like programming uh, for the plaza, uh, more intended to be a uh, picnic area and I don't know, just in the park or some other events that could happen around the, the, the plaza. And then um, towards the north, or not, sorry, it's not the north, it's the east, uh, uh, or to the top 
of the of the slide um, is the it's an area that it's uh, intended to be more ecologically functional. Uh, it treats it it uh, it deals with the lowest point uh, of the of the our site and um, it's mostly to to runoff treatment and store water management. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we're going to see the section um, that goes from A to B, and this reinforces what it, what I just uh, explained. Uh, the, the south landforms uh, speak to that uh, framing of the plaza and uh, nestle of the embrace and the freedom plaza into the common landscape. And to the south is the Parkman Bandstand. To the north, we have the Boston Common Visitor Center and uh, a little bit farther north, we have the state house, and we have there the even gentle slope for that can accommodate events, picnic, outdoor program connected to the plaza. And one of the ideas is to have this uh, programmatic uh, differentiation between these three zones. So if you go to the next slide, um, we can see how uh, if you if you're coming. Uh, towards the north, like from the south, you, you start seeing to the uh, bottom right of the slide, you can see the mounds uh, starting to raise, and then you, you have them brace, uh, and on the uh, other side, you have the visitor center that also will have a, a privileged view towards the plaza. If you go to the next one, um, the next slide, sorry, yeah. So that you have at the end of the path, or like more like it's a visual reference, the parkman, the 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 bandstand, um, yes. And to the to the right you have the 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 sculpture and the plaza, uh, a little bit like an atrium or like a space to to have a speaker notes, etc. And if you go to the next one, we have the one that. Um, uh, the 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 view from from the visitor centers uh, like looking towards Roxbury, you have the Coretta's quote um, and you have the sculpture uh, all framed in this uh, landscape. I think that's uh, pretty much about the views. I think I'm I'm done with this. If you go to the next, it makes like yeah, correct. So. Justin, all right. Yes, uh, we're, so we'll, at this point, we will uh, pass the baton to our incredible art, uh, artist team representing Hank Willis Thomas, uh, Chris and Sam. Great, thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Chris Collins. I'm with MGAC, uh, acting as a project coordinator working for uh, Hank Willis Thomas and Sangha and Company. Also joined today by Sam Geratani, who's the director of public art for Hank. Uh, so we're going to, uh, now we're finally to the meat of the presentation today, we're going to try and talk uh, probably some, some much more technical uh, issues that we're trying to get some feedback on and make sure we are heading in the right direction. If you have any questions, we would like to uh, walk you through a lot of work has been done since the springtime when the concept was approved for the artwork. Uh, so this package is including the package that we'll be uh, looking to hear back from. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the package of the installation guide is set up. It has uh, you know, plans about the shipping, the installation site plan, uh, the cranes and methods of installing, and also some of the details we'll go through today. Uh, next slide, please. The artwork will be uh, cast. It's a wax cast, the lost wax cast process where uh, the pieces that you see here in the different colors will be uh, assembled uh, finished in patina and then shipped in pieces. Each of these individual pieces uh, will fit into uh, uh, shipping. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see where these pieces uh, represented by the various colors are then going to be assembled and connected at the site. Uh, the entire project sculpture is about 63,000 pounds. So it's a, it's a fairly great adventure that we're into here. It's very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the artwork will be shipped in pieces, like, like you see here. So there will be three truck beds. They, they've been designed so that they uh, are able to ship and then be able to be assembled on site with a minimum amount of effort. Next slide, please. 
And uh, we've gone through and done some preliminary estimates on the crane and equipment that would be required to install. Uh, the artwork should be taking somewhere between seven to 14 days, depending on a number of variables that we are going to be working out once a general contractor is hired to build the landscaping and the hardscapes around the artwork. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the vendor has been studying, or the vendor, the fabricator, which is Bollinger Atelier out of Tempe, Arizona. They have studied the uh, reach required for handling these pieces. Some, a couple of them, the biggest ones are about 16,000 pounds. Uh, through our work in studying the site, uh, it's been determined that we can probably get a little bit closer. So the equipment that you see in this package will likely be reduced and we can use uh, some smaller cranes. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a 90 ton crane. Next slide. I'll kind of breeze through these here. Uh, you know, obviously we're working in a safe manner. We can do the next one, please. And next slide. So that's the equipment that'll be used. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the planning that's gone into this. Uh, our friends at Mass Design Group have been pulling together the structural components of the foundation that will support the artwork. Um, the the fabricator is also going to be the installer. That's part of our work is our contract. And the artwork will uh, be assembled and connected on site with the same hands that make it in Arizona. Uh, what you see here is, is, a, is basically a, a template where we will use, it's a, it'll be a metal template to locate the artwork attachment points on the footings. Next place. Uh, so once we locate the connection points, uh, each of the pieces will be basically set up with some temporary support structure. Next, please. And when these pieces are put together, there is an internal armature uh, of a stainless steel. It's a, a 12 by 12 tube steel. It's a quite a sturdy um, internal armature that will be supported and connected to the bronze. They'll be welded together on the site where the pieces connect. Uh, next slide, please. And then we go through here, this is a little bit detailed, but it shows the, the steps and sequencing for the art being installed. When the artwork will be installed, it will be an area that'll be dedicated to just the uh, fabricators and uh, obviously sanctioned, sectioned off so that the public is not seeing the welding work. And uh, so that's done in a safe way in the park. Next slide, please. And some more diagrams here, next slide. And then uh, as you can see, then this, the second pieces all are done there. No, that's good. You can go to the next one. Thank you. Again, this is fairly detailed. Um, so the commission can look at this at another time. But uh, uh, the tentative in, uh, procedure, tentative insta install procedure we have here will be to connect the internal armature welded and then the bronze surface patches and then the seams will be welded. Uh, the bronze itself will be patinated uh, off-site and then once the welds are done uh, they'll be patched and seamed and then uh, patinaed at the connections. So again with the same hands that made them in Arizona. Next slide please. Uh, this is one example of a similar sculpture. It's out of stainless steel uh, that Bollinger put together. Next slide. And there's the completed project there. Next slide please. Uh, we also separately have submitted the, it's a three page design set, uh, but I pulled together, we pulled together a couple of diagrams here from that set um, just for illustrated purposes that shows where the internal uh, armature is connected down to the foundation. That's all coordinated and uh, it shows how the internal armature is connected on the inside to the bronze sculpture. Uh, at the very bottom, the artwork and the armature will be connected to the footing foundations. All those connections will be hidden and there will be a, a small shadow at the very bottom of the artwork. Uh, so the connection point will be uh, made structurally, the artwork will be installed, and then after that, the general contractor will come in to put the pavers right underneath the very bottom of the artwork. So uh, it will look like it's resting on its elbows. Next slide, please. I'm gonna have Sam talk about this, the, the patina. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. I'm Sam. I'm grateful and honored to be working alongside of Chris and Justin and Melissa and Amari. Um, but I'm also Hank Willis Thomas's artist representative um, and manage his public art project company called Saga and Company, which was actually uh, named after Hank, 
Hank's late cousin, Sangha, who died tragically from gun violence. Um, but mostly I liaise between Hank's art studio and our fabricators. Um, and this slide is based on recommendations from a multitude of fabricators, um, but also to talk, to speak to the bronze of the embrace. So as was conceptually approved, our embrace sculpture will utilize a warmer honeycomb patina um, and it will refer to the bronzes in the park, but it also will maintain its own identity. Um, to refresh, a patina is a thin film of color that is created by the application of heat and chemicals. Um, and the color comes from the reaction of the copper and the bronze with the chemicals. Um, on the slide, you can also see some pictures that were sent to us from our fabricator that were made in our fabricator that we are um, talking with. The photo with the number two is actually a photo of the actual sample that was made specifically for this sculpture um, and will be shared with you when we're able to share it with you. Um, it was taken actually outside so it can truly reflect what it would look like in daylight and sunlight. Um, with maintenance, um, re-waxing annually or biannually is actually very much recommended um, to retain that patina and the integrity of that color. Um, because those wax and the overcoating uh, protects the patina, this is also going to help with a harsh climate like Boston. Um, but with wax coatings, especially in high trafficked areas, um, there will be some erosion to the wax. So we're going to make sure that the finishing of the sculpture will have simple maintenance procedures so that we can kind of anticipate that this will be uh, highly trafficked and utilized by our visitors, which is what we're hoping for. Um, thinking of the application of the wax and the maintenance of it, bronze experts have rec recommended to reapply annually, biannually, uh, but we should also take this into consideration with some other uh, damages like UV light and water. Um, so rain and snow can accumulate on areas of the sculpture, uh, but in this case, we're gonna be working with fabricators to determine the best placement for the weep holes and also to ensure proper drainage. Um, we'll also make sure to consider how other parts of the sculpture could potentially be susceptible to lawn maintenance, like sprinklers or even that, the addition of salt to kind of de-ice uh, around the plaza. So we can be uh, very prepared and adequately anticipate some of the damage that could occur. Um, for cleaning, it's recommended to use a non-ionic soap and a non-abrasive tool to wash away any dirt and grime before wax is applied. Um, and conservators that are very familiar with this process can be responsible for both the cleaning and the re-waxing. And specifically local conservators are an added benefit because they can be they are very equipped with what is used in an environment like Boston, in a coastal environment like Boston. That's good. And Sam, just to jump into uh, the, I, I neglected to mention that the artwork, uh, you know, on the inside, you'll have some condensation. We want, we're not expecting a ton of water to, to move through the artwork, but you'll have a little bit. Uh, and also where the, where the hands hit the arm, you know, there are just as a matter of the sculpture and how it's made, there are some areas where water could pond. So that's where we'll put weep holes in and that will allow the water to drain through. The, the sculpture is designed to let that water, uh, again, it's very small amounts, move through the sculpture. It's a stainless steel internal structure and that will move out the bottom and onto the plaza. So uh, that I think this designed very appropriately. Um, and then the next slide we talk about kind of uh, one of the things we want to bring you in on on the process of where we are right now. Uh, we've, we've really enjoyed as a team uh, working with the various departments uh, within the city of Boston. And uh, obviously today we're having the advisory meeting, so we're not looking for formal approval, but if we have any questions that relate to the sculpture specifically, uh, you know, the plan is to uh, finalize and finish 90% of the landscape drawings and submit those for uh, review and approval in January. Uh, and really that's Parks uh, Parks and the Friends would be doing that and then uh, come back to the BAC for a final review of the artwork in February. 
Um, the one thing we would love to just point out to you is that the artwork fabrication will take 17 months from the point where uh, the artwork has been released for fabrication. So it really is the long pole in the tent for, uh, for getting this project going and, and, and into, into fabrication. So, um, you know, there is a little bit more time and some more details on the landscape and, and details that will be worked out with Park. We're really trying to push this along so we can get the artwork released. Um, and I think what we're, yeah. sorry, Chris. Go ahead. We, we, Chris and I had agreed to be Howard Cosell and the other guy doing play 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 by play and color commentary. This is our first uh, run at it, so uh, we, we might ha hiccup over each other. Uh, and, and and I think you know the, the long tail on the creating of the the uh, Embrace Memorial. Uh, leads us to the fall of 2022. And so, you know, we, we are excited uh, and we imagine uh, a, a post vaccine Boston um, unveiling the Embrace Memorial. And, and, and this, this project feels like uh, the convergence of a lot of good ideas. Paul English, who was the founder and the conceiver of this idea, imagined a Boston with Dr. King's, uh, with a Dr. King Memorial and it evolved through community process to turn into a memorial for Dr. and Mrs. King with a community outreach process for the art. Um, and then it evolved further into honoring Boston civil rights leaders. And so, you know, we, we think Dr. and Mrs. King are, are worthy of a memorial and, and I appreciate all of our support to get us this far. We think the Boston civil rights leaders are, are worthy of being memorialized and being a part of this plaza. But we also think we as Bostonians are also worthy of living in a, in a Boston free of racism, uh, free of economic injustice, um, and, and free of, of fear. And so uh, this, this project represents um, a crown jewel in Boston post vaccine. Um, and, um, and part of the unveiling is a, a catalytic moment uh, for the Embrace Ideas Summit, uh, a week long conference, festival, music um, gathering, uh, which, is, which will be a permanent event one year before the NAACP conference in 2023 uh, for us to celebrate what it means for Boston to be the most uh, anti-racist, equitable city in America. And so th thank you for uh, uh, hearing us and having us uh, present some of this material. And, and I wanna stop talking for a second and uh, open it up for comments and feedback. Thank you so much for that presentation. I, I love the way you opened up, Imari, with honoring the people who are a part of the civil rights movement in Boston. And so um, I'd like to invite the commissioners to comment or ask questions or make suggestions or anything that they think will help us get this project to a final sign off in February. Anything that would be helpful. Well, I'll, I'll start off with a question that I had. Um, the Coretta Scott King quote, is that in bronze set into uh, granite? Uh, Equa, I think, I think the, the plan is, is for it to be embedded into the, uh, the bench, the, the uh, wave area. Mm -hmm. and I, I think we're still thinking through um, what that might look like. Um, it, it's definitely going to be in that area, but if it's bronze or another beautiful material, I think, I think we're still trying to figure out, um, based on that, um, the, the, the process with parks, um, the, the, the appropriate material for the maintenance. Cause I think part of the, 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 the process that Sam described, um, you know, might require a different level of maintenance for the plaza. And so I, I think we want to make it as, as meaningful and beautiful as possible, but it will be um a part of the 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 sloping bench area in the back and and i think the other thing that we're currently working on is the exact quote and so um we're, we're still consulting with with our attorneys and the king estate to uh get the clearance uh to use uh mrs king's quote um in in, in that way mm -hmm. other thoughts Okay. 
Okay. Um, I just have one question. I, I know you keep on referring to reviewing it with parks, but I'm also assuming that you're including the Landmarks Commission in the review. Uh, uh, we, we, we are, and, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to my new guy hat. Um, I, I'm fortunate that I, that I have uh, our, our friends, um, you know, that I'm not doing this alone. And so uh, it, it's both parks and landmarks. That's right, Michael. Okay, just want to yeah. make sure. That's right. Uh, that was probably inadvertently left off of the of the that last slide, but that will be uh, done probably as well in February or March. Because yeah, I would hate for you guys to get so far down the road and then all of a sudden realize you have to go through the Landmarks Commission, which then could slow things down. So mm -hmm. just a reminder. They've, they've already been consulted, I believe. And, and uh, Justin, you can maybe talk to that a little bit if you want, but uh, they're, they've already been in the loop. Yes, we're, we're doing our, our, our best to incorporate all of the uh, perspectives, um, you know, that are um, necessary to address for a work of, of this scale and importance. Um, and thank you for flagging that. And um, yes, the, the design we shared with you tonight reflects feedback that we've received from them to date. It's really helpful to see the images of the material and the patina and to see more detail around like how seams are gonna to come together and, and all of that. And I'm wondering, and this isn't necessarily a question for the um, presenters, but I think for the commission and for staff, I'm wondering kind of like, what is the level of detail that we wanna see um, on that as we move forward or in order to, to be at approvals at the next stage? Because I think, um, it would be great to get even more kind of views and, and detail and images, um, but I don't know like what, and maybe Karen, this is a question for you, like what would normally be included kind of in an end package for approval? Yeah, so our plan was to go through um, the, the, the guide that um, we went over briefly tonight in more detail and send some written feedback to them, which we can share. Um, we know that um, the, the landmarks um, uh, will we'll have a lot of concerns as well, but we're really going to be looking at sort of long term life of the project um, and, and plans around that as well as installation. The other thing I want to mention is that um, the Parks Department and Landscape, uh, sorry, not Landscape and um, Landmarks, they're also working with the city archaeologists and that's an ongoing process. Um, Michael, I thought um, that might be of interest to you as well. Um, and the uh, archaeologists have been working with the Massachusetts tribe, and we're looking forward to um, getting their final recommendations as well. So there, there's a lot of sort of detail that we'll be pulling into review for all of you for thinking about um, once we get that maintenance plan um, and can really think about like what, what it will mean for this product to be there and whether we think it seems like uh, fully viable. Yeah, I mean, I think just in terms of a, a gut reaction, just seeing these images, I'm I'm excited to see how much it approximates the some of the original um, kind of renderings of the artwork that we saw. Like, I think that the and and it'd be great to get more information, but I think the color and the tone of that is um, pretty similar to what I had pictured from some of the original um, drawings and things that were submitted. I don't know if, how other commissioners feel about that, but um, it looks, I mean, it looks pretty good to me. Yeah, I, I think we'll want to also follow up about the patining on site. And um, I know, Amari, you offered very generously to um, make the sample available. So I think, you know, maybe having a, a socially distanced viewing uh, would be really great and we could arrange that but I think we'd also want to you know think about what does that really mean to be doing the patina on site um, and you have some um, examples showing some details on that um, and then uh, you know what might be some ways we can test that so I think we want to think through some some of that but we really hope tonight to get like any like big picture problems so that when we come back in February that um, this team um, which has taken on such a big project um, is is ready to get get approval um, if there's anything needing to be flagged we can get them that to them in the next couple weeks this may not be anything important but the the patina speaking of the patina this is a very touchable piece of sculpture 
and I see your maintenance plan for sort of an overall yearly cleaning and waxing. Uh, are there any thoughts about just the day-to-day -day touching that will go on um, and how that will affect the surface of the, the piece? Do, do there need to be shorter term um, interventions for certain parts of it that people are constantly touching? Definitely, yes. We're in talk with conservators on a very consulting basis uh, because the, the sculpture hasn't been fabricated yet, but we do want to encourage people to go and touch. So this is going to be something that we're going to deliberate over with conservators and the fabricator to make sure that this would be a simple procedure to maintain, kind of like the ducklings in the park. Mm -hmm. um, we would want to make sure that it wouldn't erode the surface of the bronze, but it would be able to withstand touching and visitors mm -hmm. interaction with it. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, 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 I have a question. Uh, are, is this whole process being documented? Um, and I'm just wondering, because I think it's pretty fascinating to see how this sculptor is, this sculpture is being put together. And um, I just, I remember years ago seeing a documentary on the, uh, the Bill and I and Pei did in uh, Washington DC, the National Gallery. Of, and just seeing how, um, Basically, they was a film from A to Z about how the, that building was um, commissioned, designed, constructed, and then the final. And it was a fascinating um, movie to to see. And I just would think that something documenting this whole process would be also a fascinating thing to to see, and it'd be a great way of sort of. Um, adding to the memorial of, of this piece and Dr. King and others. So I just wondering if, if, if there's thoughts about how to sort of document this whole process. <clears throat> yeah, usually with large scale commissions, we document the entire process and it is archived with a percent for our program. Um, so it's definitely a great question and thing to flag to make sure that we do because like many, I really nerded out over the whole embrace install guide being put it to putting together. So I would love to have that be shared. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think Michael, we, we've also been in talks with uh, one of the local media outlets about documenting as well. And so archival is, is one of our charges as King Boston. And so um, similar to the Embrace uh, documentary film, um, we were hoping to premiere uh, something utilizing some of the pieces of the actual fabrication in Arizona. And I know we haven't talked fully about that, Sam, uh, but documenting some of the pieces, the conversations that have had footage from the original documentary, which talk about the process leading up to it. Um, and, and so if you guys remember in, in August, they premiered the 30 minute doc of the Embrace King section. Uh, and so this other part would, would probably be premiered uh, in 2022 during the, um, the unveiling ceremony. And so this media outlet is also, we're, we're talking to them about a, a film festival that would occur during the Embrace Ideas Summit in uh, October 2022. Thank you. Excellent. And Mari, if I, or, um, and, and Chris and Sam, if I might ask, is it possible when you do come back, we could get more, um, more details, more explanation of what welding on site looks like and what that process will, will really look like? I'm sure we'll have more, more follow-up questions on you, but I think also sharing, sharing that could be, could be helpful. You bet. And, and it will all be done within what the regulations and requirements are for welding out in public space too. So um, that's, uh, that's no problem. Okay, so we're a little bit over time. I just want to extend to the commissioners one more opportunity to weigh in with any comments or suggestions or questions. 
Yeah, I was going to actually ask the team if they, you know, we just recently had a bomb cyclone roll through Boston. And if there was any dam tree damage that happened in the parks, maybe find out about it just to kind of, you know, for you guys to get more an idea of the harsh conditions of the park. Wow. Did you say a bomb? I think it was called a bumbo cyclone or something. Yeah, there's lots of tree damage all over. Oh. Well, Boston has a lot of old trees, that's for sure. Anyone else? I would just, just echo, I just have some questions about maybe planned interpretation at the site. Um, and even Amari, you know, your presentation demonstrated how many important stories there are to tell. Um, and just wondering how we're kind of thinking about telling those stories at the kind of site itself, either on the plaza or through technology. I just don't want that to get lost in the mix. So it doesn't seem like an afterthought in the design process. And but so that kind of interpretive piece feels integrated into the overall design concept is something that I think I'll kind of be looking for um, as we continue to um, narrow in on the final project. And I know that's more of a kind of detailed element, but something to hopefully not get lost in the mix. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And one of the things that we've been talking about is actually having, um, and this is a working title, uh, joy ambassadors out by the embrace that are King Boston uh, staffers. And so thinking about the EGI, EJI Museum in, um, in Alabama, um, folks out there to help people translate the trauma or the emotions that they're feeling. Uh, and, and we're hoping that the embrace emotes joy and really a new commitment to well-being as a part of anti-racist work. And so we, we do actually see it staff with, with, with people to, you know, not sell tours, but really translate the joy for folks as a part of the process. And so that's one of the things that we're thinking through um, from a King Boston perspective. I'd like to then open it up to any public comment or questions or thoughts. This is your chance to uh, get in on the project and contribute your ideas. Uh, any names that you might have of people that should be considered as part of this honoring. Um, I know one of my questions was, what about the arts community? But I have to go back and check my dates for people like Elma Lewis and Dana Chandler, who might not have been marching, but were doing uh, dynamic artworks that inspired the community as they walked and marched. Curious about that. Any other? Uh, Echo, that's a good point. I, I think we, we're, we're trying to get, um, we're pulling together a committee to help um, understand who who the who the folks are who, who all the actors are so um I, I, we will definitely follow up um in soliciting folks to be a part of this committee i don't think we want to make these decisions in a vacuum and um i think similarly uh to to the process of selecting the art we, we want to uh ensure that uh we memorialize uh folks who who were um, a part of this time period 63 to 67. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and can I say one thing? We keep flashing a picture, but I, I want to acknowledge Simone Martin Newberry, who is the artist of the um, um, the image that's at the end. Uh, a lot of times, those our artists don't don't get the recognition, and so I want to not flash it and, and not cite the the artist. Uh, she's uh, a young African American artist who who's done some amazing pieces. And if you Google her, you'll you'll see a lot of uh, beautiful pieces that are online or or on Instagram. Amari, can you say her name one more time? Simone Martin Newberry. Thank you. Or well, if you want, you can type it into the chat because um, I know I'll forget that. Um. Okay. So nothing from the audience um, today. Can I make a comment? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Shauna Worrell Waldron. I just wanted to say thank you to your vision, Imari. Um, growing up in Boston and 
remembering field trips and going to see statues. I don't recall seeing many of our that represent our history. So I really thank you for this vision. And I really think that it will be life changing for many in our in our city. So thank you. Thank you, Jana. Okay, a few more moments. I know this is recorded for the public record, but sometimes when it's quiet, I can't tell if I'm frozen. And so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully people will move their heads because <laughs> I'm like, am I froze? It got quiet. <laughs> I'm scrolling through to see if there are any hands raised. Mari, I think it just meant you did a really good job. I agree. I mean, okay. people aren't I'm quiet in these meetings when they're not happy. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> All right, then, if, do you want to make any closing remarks, Simari, before we get ready to adjourn? Um, I, I just want to thank everyone for their time and um, um, thank everyone, every single one of us on, on, on the Zoom and, and the, the, the hundreds of folks who've been involved in this process before I got here. Um, again, thinking about Boston post-vaccine, um, our, our city and our region has a, a wonderful opportunity um, I, I imagine in 2022, Vice President Harris breaking the proverbial champagne bottle over the Embrace Memorial and us celebrating Boston as the, the most just city in America. And so thank you for being a part of that, uh, that vision. Many of you who were here way before I got here. And so um, I, I really thank you and, and um, uh, I, I hope and, and, and think about our safety during, during the next couple of weeks um, as, as we get into the vaccine stage of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Happy holidays. Thank you. So Karen, I guess you'll be communicating with um, Mass Design. And for now, uh, we'll look forward to your presentation in February uh, with a positive result. And I am ready for a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn tonight's meeting. I'll second. Right. Awesome, so a motion to adjourn has been made and seconded. I'm gonna call all the commissioners. Um, Bob Freeman, I'll start with you. Yes. Lisa Tung. Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> John Andres. Yes. Cara Elliott Ortega. Yes. Uh, Camilo Alvarez. Yes. Brian Hone. Yes. Michael Canizo. Yes. I believe that that's everyone. So we are adjourned. Uh, thank you all for coming to the meeting, all of the public that came, all of the commissioners, all of the presenters. I thought this was a wonderful meeting and look forward to the future of public art in Boston. Thank you, Equa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I took